Uh, muchas gracias. Uh, lo siento. Um, I can't speak Spanish. I'm sorry. Um, it's a real privilege to be here, an honor, and thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation and being here with you all. It's um, inspiring. The program looks amazing, and I'm very happy to be here learning from all of you. I've called this presentation Down Under Geographies of Genders and Sexualities, a view from post-colonial Aotearoa New Zealand. And New Zealand is, in the globe, at the bottom, or down under, so we use that term, down under. In thinking about views, most of you will be familiar with this type of view of New Zealand. This 19 10 map shows New Zealand as part of the Pacific Ocean. Significantly, all the countries of the British Empire at this time were pink. Today, the pink colour may seem transgressive or even gay. Back then, it signified New Zealand's link to the mother country, to Britain. Breaking with those colonial ties and reimagining New Zealand as something other than a colony has been difficult. The Treaty of Waitangi was signed in 1840, which is an agreement between the British Crown and about 540 Māori chiefs, the indigenous people of New Zealand. The treaty is a broad statement of principles on which the British and Māori made a political compact to found a nation state and to build a government in New Zealand. The document has three articles. In the English version, Māori cede the sovereignty of New Zealand to Britain. Māori give Crown an exclusive right to buy lands they wish to sell and in return are guaranteed full rights of ownership of their lands, forests, fisheries and other possessions and Māori are given the rights and privileges of British subjects. So, a little bit more history. In redrawing maps of New Zealand, from a post-colonial perspective, one might see this. This map represents a Māori worldview of Aotearoa, or New Zealand. Rather than a God's eye, top-down view, the map with a map oriented to the north. Here we have a canoe or waka centred Māori view. Nga unga waka or the landing place of the canoes are those that brought people uh, Māori to Aotearoa and it highlights the importance of genealogy for Māori. For Māori one's place in the world is linked to your genealogy particularly your tribal canoe that arrived in the land of the long white cloud, which is what the name of New Zealand is, Aotearoa. The landing of the waka is one of the features that helps establish authority for tribes. So these are contemporary, um, importance is contemporary, socially, politically and spiritually today. So, Today my discussion emphasises some of my personal and professional entanglements of doing queer and post-colonial geography in New Zealand. I have been researching genders, sexualities and space in New Zealand since the mid-90s. And doing queer research and political action in a post-colonial settler society means that my gendered and sexual identity is always entangled with race, ethnicity and post-coloniality. By way of example of this entanglement, if I was delivering a similar speech at home in New Zealand, I would begin in te reo in Māori language. So let me start my speech again. Tihe Māori ora, inga mana, inga reo, ino ho ifa, 
Itifare, Wailanga e Metropolitan Autonomous University o Mekiko, Itune, Proaringa Tangama, Monte Fare Wailanga o Wakato Aotearoa, a hau Paulin de Johnston tōku ingoa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. So here I acknowledge the spiritualities that breathe life to us all. I acknowledge the great leaders here at this event. I acknowledge all their speakers and people from the four corners of the world. I acknowledge this house of the host institutions. I acknowledge and respect the hosts and, I, and I'm from the University of Waikato and my name is Linda Johnston's greetings to you all. If I were Māori, I would also acknowledge my canoe that I arrived in the country, my mountain, my river, my tribe, but I'm not Māori, I'm Pākehā, which is a name for a Māori word for settler society people in New Zealand. I was born and raised in a rural settlement in the southern part of the South Island of New Zealand. And I have a rural working class family background, which I bring to my presentation. So, so I offer two examples of queer activism and research in New Zealand. The first example is of the Top Twins. They are comedian entertainers. They are genderqueer, lesbians, twins, Pākehā, like me. The second is from research that I do with the group called Hamilton Pride. In both of these examples, I highlight the intersections of gender, sexuality, and indigeneity, and the ways in which Pākehā lesbians, myself and the top twins, attempt to follow Māori culture and processes when working and living in a post-colonial nation. I conclude my presentation by urging scholars to engage in more research at the intersections of indigeneity, gender, sex and spatiality. Uh, the documentary that I, I will show a short clip of, The Top Twins, Untouchable Girls, the movie, quickly became an important cultural text in New Zealand. Not long after it was released, I was delighted to have an opportunity to review it for um, the journal Emotion, Space and Society. So in order for you to get a sense of what the top twins do, I'll show you a clip of this documentary. It's all about blue. <laughs> 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 You know, mothers sometimes say, oh, we don't go wrong. Mum was great. She said, it's got nothing to do with me. That was a shock. Yeah. She said, wait until your sister finds out. And I said, you've got to know me. <laughs> Thank 
Here we go, two mix in the same circles. And I'll leave there the ladies' man, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Please, that worked. So. The Top Twins movie brings together archival footage of protest movements, home movies, interviews with prominent comedians, musicians, the Twins' parents, the Twins' partners, and even the then New Zealand Prime Minister, Helen Clark, as well as mock documentary moments when the twins' characters talk about the twins. The film's power therefore goes beyond the seated audience in cinemas to circulate an impact on popular culture throughout New Zealand. And importantly, the documentary plays back to New Zealanders half a century of cultural, social and political change change through political protests such as Māori land rights and occupations, the nuclear-free New Zealand movement, anti-apartheid protests during the 1981 South African Springbok rugby tour, support for the 1986 Homosexual Law Reform Bill, and the twins were there with a microphone and a song and a deep commitment to social justice. The Tim the Top Twins take seriously collectively held emotions and values as expressed so vividly in the song and the chosen title of their documentary. We live in a world that doesn't care too much. You've got to stand up. You've got to have guts. So 36 years ago, the Twins joined anti-apartheid protests in Hamilton, where I now live, against the South African Rugby Team Tour of New Zealand. The tour was also an opportunity to address the issue of racism in New Zealand, while also showing solidarity with the oppressed black majority in South Africa. Along with 5,000 other protesters, the twins occupied the Hamilton rugby pitch, halted the game, chanted the whole world is watching, held up posters that simply said shame. Riot, squeak, Riot squad police surrounded the protesters and 30,000 rugby fans made their anger visible and audible. In thinking back to this scene, I'm reminded of Elspeth Proben's analysis of shame arising from a desire to fit in and at the same time a feeling of being out of place. Proben notes that shame is indicative of how the contagiousness of collective effects works to expose any breaches in the borders between the self and the other. The documentary shows the shame of racism both at home and away. Māori musician and activist Miriana Pittman was at the protest in Hamilton. She remains, she remembers the twins were very visible, fearless, fearless and trustworthy. She said, we will all sing, we would all sing to provide encouragement to the people. They are true friends and companions and true allies, and there was never a time that we didn't trust them. That was an unusual relationship at the time for Māori activists. Pākehā, non-Māori people were the butt of our activism, but they, the top twins, were not included in that. They knew where the boundaries were. The Pākehā Top Twins protested beside Māori during the Springbok rugby tour. They stood beside Māori during occupation of Māori land in Auckland City, Bastion Point. They protested against the Crown's decision to sell the tribe's land and maintained that was wrongly taken from the tribe. As we heard earlier in the Top Twins documentary, Jules explained their presence at these protests in a typical understated way. She said in any political movement there's always some music and a song that maybe makes people feel brave or strong or gives a sense of freedom. People will listen to a song before they will listen to a speech a lot of the time. I'm not going to sing it but you can see the lyrics. In the documentary the twins and Miriana Pittman sing Na Iwi Ae 
which calls for unity like the Pacific Ocean and all young women to rise up and be strong. Wahine ma, wahine ma, maranga mai, maranga mai, kia kaha. So this history matters in a way that encourages further political possibilities, particularly for me as Pākehā, as non Māori, as queer, lesbian and living and working in New Zealand. In this sense, the fracturing of subjectivities or identity along lines of gender, sexuality and ethnicity has a very place-based dimension. I had the opportunity to reflect on this when writing a chapter for um, Andrew Gorman Murray and Gordon Waite for the book um, Queer Methods and Methodologies, edited by Kath Brown and Catherine Nash. And with hindsight and time and reflection, I realised that my embodied subjectivities matter living and researching down under in New Zealand. It is impossible to understand gender, sex and sexuality without considering issues of biculturalism, multiculturalism, racism, colonisation and post-colonialism. In Aotearoa, New Zealand, concepts of sexuality, queerness, gender, ethnicity do not translate easily into Māori world views. While the word takatapui tends to be used currently to embrace non-heterosexual forms of Māori sexuality, it is a term that has a pre-colonial history that is different from the history of the terms such as queer, gay, lesbian. There are of course many terms used to indicate gender and sexual Māori subjectivities such as takatapui, an intimate companion of the same sex, hinito, drag queen, hinihi, transgender, tangata ira tane, a person who has the essence of a man, tanga, tangata ira wahini, a person who has the essence of a woman, the kai hini kiri, recognizing oneself as female, like a wahini, to be like a woman, uh, used by male to female transgender Māori. And from our family in other parts of the Pacific, we have Whafafine from Samoa, Whakaleti from Tonga, and Akavine from the Cook Islands. In a publication called Ko I He O She, produced by the New Zealand AIDS Foundation Māori HIV, HIV Prevention Programme, the author Jordan Harris explains in the language of our ancestors, there was no pronoun to distinguish gender, such as he or she. There was ear, which was used to distinguish that person regardless of their gender. So was there a Māori word for transgender? Were our ancestors aware that for some, gender is not defined at birth? Such differences in understanding gender, sexuality, ethnicity for Pākehā and Māori can be traced through my research into gay activism with and for Māori. So my last example for this evening is about my participation in a community political organisation called Hamilton Pride. And here I highlight the post-colonial community practices and appropriate ways for working with and for Māori. <coughs> So I'm drawing on my experience as a founding committee member of Hamilton Pride since uh, 2007. And with this group's consent, I conducted research on queer feelings of belonging in and to place. The group Hamilton Pride's mission statement is together celebrating and supporting the diversity of Hamilton's rainbow community. And the aim of this participatory research with Hamilton Pride was to further understand the relationship between sexual identity, place, feelings, and uh, power for people in Hamilton's rainbow communities. So this kind of research is important to understand Hamilton's queer geographies and may help social cohesion and inclusion for non-heterosexuals in an increasingly diverse 
yet still cisgendered, heteronormative, and often homophobic society. So the people on our organising committee identify as Takatapui Tane, Takatapui Wahine, queer male, lesbian, bisexual, transsexual and transgender women, gay and asexual. So we're a young organisation made up of just a small number of dedicated organisers with a desire to build and sustain healthy communities. In short, our, commu our organisation remains committed to resisting injustice and engaging in constructive direct action. And as our Pride Festival and activities for World AIDS Days have shown, direct action is about visibility, celebration and letting Hamilton know that gender and sexual difference gay, lesbian, bisexual, takatapu, transgender, intersex, queer, pansexual, etc. should be welcomed and not discouraged and definitely not marginalised. So to give you a sense of what this place Hamilton is like, here are some images. Um, it's uh, New Zealand's fourth largest city with a huge population of 161,200. <laughs> Not quite like Mexico City. <laughs> um, Hamilton's population, uh, you can see there, is 65.3% uh, Pākehā or white settler society people like myself. Māori make up uh, about 20% of the population. Asian 10.6, Pacific Peoples 4.2, and I'm afraid Latin, not many Latin American. Hamilton has long been a service centre for industry and in the surrounding area and its economy is based on farming and agricultural income. At the north end of the city is a colonialist heteronormative statue of a Pākehā farming family consisting of a husband, a wife, two children, a dog, a cow and a sheep. And more recently, a statue of Riff Rat a cross-dressing character from the cult film of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. So we have two very different statues in Hamilton. Uh, Richard O'Brien, who wrote and performed the Rocky Horror Picture Show, lived and worked in Hamilton. The first settlement of this region was, of course, Māori. The Tainui tribe, a tribe called Tainui, Gave, called an area of the west bank of the Waikato River Kirikiri Roa, which means long stretch of gravel. Māori lived in cultivated gardens and agriculture along the river for about 800 years, but in 1863 the New Zealand Settlement Act was passed so that the Crown could take Māori land. 2.0 million hectares of land was confiscated. And this land was provided for the basis of European or white settler um, settlement. Colonisers renamed Kirikiri Roa Hamilton after a captain, Captain John Charles Fane Hamilton, who was killed in a battle fighting Māori close to the city. So back to present day, uh, this group I work with, Hamilton Pride, its collective vision is to serve as a, a liaison between different groups as Pride events are coordinated and organised, to publicise Hamilton Pride events locally and nationally through various media, and to support various community groups as they come together to organise annual Pride events. So we do things such as annual festivals, World um, HIV AIDS days and fundraisers, transgender remembrance events. We support and fundraise for events such as Hui Takatapui, and Hui means uh, a meeting, and Hikoi on heels, and Hikoi means to march. Hui Takatapui is a biannual national event that celebrates and strengthens sexual and gender diversity of Māori, particularly for young Māori. 
So to raise funds for this meeting for Māori, the group I'm part of, Hamilton Pride, supported Hikoi on Heels during one of our annual festivals. Um, now Hikoi, as I said, means march, and it also usually means protest and protest against Pākehā or white, uh, white people in New Zealand. Here is, a, is of course a reference to cross-dressing or drag performance. The Hikoi on Heels party in Hamilton was extremely successful and highly political because it took a Māori tradition or custom and queered it. Takatāpui or queer Māori performed a kind of a dance, um, it's called kapahaka, and they wore traditional Māori women's dress. It was a drag performance that was in place in the nightclub and it's part of the Hui Takatāpui event. But outside of that place, it would, it would have certainly prompted anger from many straight Māori. So for many years, I've chaired this Hamilton Pride group with um, this person, Jeff Roine. Jeff Roine is a descendant of uh, New Zealand Aotearoa tribes, Māori tribes, and also tribes from Rarotonga in the Cook Islands. So Te Arawa and Tainui Waka of Aotearoa and Araiti Tonga Waka of Rarotonga Cook Islands. Jeff was a health promoter for gay men's health and ran a health program for the New Zealand AIDS Foundation for 10 years. The poster you can see in that slide was developed by the New Zealand AIDS Foundation wellness team as part of their work to prevent the spread of HIV. It also aimed to illustrate that for Māori, for Takatāpui, people who are gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual, intersex, etc., have a place within Māori culture. When Jeff and I chair our Hamilton Pride group meetings, we always start with appropriate Māori custom. And they begin with a karakia, which is a type of a ritual prayer or greeting to bring the place under a special um, uh, sacredness and to address any spiritual requirements of, at the meeting. And at the end of the meeting, we eat, we have supper. These refreshments at the end signify the sacredness has finished and everyone can be ordinary or noah again. So this custom is something that we continue with our annual Pride events. For instance, at each festival, begins with a whakato, which is a welcoming speech, and a karakia, that type of prayer, um, to place the festival under sacredness so that Māori ancestors are happy with what we are doing and support us. We have prominent Māori, prominent takatāpui to launch our festivals. Now whenever possible and whenever pro appropriate, Pākehā and Māori Pride also adopt ideas, concepts and methods that correspond with Māori belief systems. And in thinking about these practices, I'm guided by an indigenous approach which is called um, Kopapa Māori. And it has a, an epistemological stance that distances it, itself from traditional Western uh, concepts and practices and determines its own agenda based on values, belief systems and actions according to Māori tradition. Um, there is a, a, a famous geographer in New Zealand who was one of the founding members of the university that I am at, at University of Waikato, her name is Evelyn Stokes, and she was one of the first Pākehā geographers to advocate that we must work with and for Māori and, and, and continue to do Māori ge geography. So, There is uh, a, a, a burgeoning literature, more literature in the area of gender, sexuality and ethnicity in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And in 2007, 
um, an Auckland based company, produced an excellent book called Sexuality and Stories of Indigenous People. And it was published, uh, edited by Jessica Hutchins and Clive Espin. However, even with this encouraging development, there are still many opportunities for social scientists, geographers and others to engage at the intersections of gender, sexuality and ethnicity. Engaging with these issues demands a greater sensitivity to difference. In my research on gender, sexuality, space and my com community practice and politics with Hamilton Pride, means that I have become acutely aware of ethnicity, gender, and sexuality as mutually defining subjectivities. So colonization is always lived, experienced, embodied, negotiated, and resisted by colonial subjects um, and those whom it dispossesses. Colonization is comprised of active, evolving, not yet complete, and ever-present practices. It is a continuing endeavor that unfolds across myriad geographies with remarkable varied results, including deterioration, marginalization, and sustained injustices between people and places. I hope that what I've shown today is that being a post-colonial Pākehā, a lesbian, queer, geographer in Aotearoa means a continual critique of colonising discourses. The top twins are national, national figures and role models for Pākehā uh, queers who, like me, wish to critique colonisation. For me personally, I've learned a great deal working with Takatāpui with Māori and recognising, like the top twins, where the boundaries are. There is still a great deal to be done at the intersections of indigeneity, gender, sex and spatiality. Ko te ake nei, enough said from me. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa and gracias. <laughs>